Welcome to Cinema Chop Shop. Watch, chop, retrofit. Also, don't know what drinking you love. Family Rose is a great album. That's the one she did with Jack White. There's a song on that called Portland, Oregon. But this is not a. Uh, Loretta Lynn podcast and and just fanning <laughs> Travis's ego podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Chop Shop. We are back and we're in the proper studio tonight mm-hmm. after our adventure with the uh, Wanted Man. The watch that was party. fun, you guys. Oh, I was. I wish I could have been there for it, but I did sync up and watch the movie. Oh, with, awesome! With your guys's um, commentary. And I felt like I was in the room. I kept trying to interject. <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately listened to it a second time with with my wife Allie. She watched it, and oh, so well. we did the we did the experience like like not two days after we did it. So oh, nice! I got my fill of that fucking movie. <laughs> I bet you did. Yeah. Like four times you saw it. Uh, two, 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 times, two total. Yeah. It felt like four. It felt like four. But uh, we're not talking about that today. Tonight uh, we're going to be talking about. Blind spots. Um, Wait, you haven't seen that? You haven't seen that? Uh, it's something we've been kind of talking about for a while, uh-huh. and that is uh, films that uh, are egregiously absent from our filmographies. Uh, and so we all selected two films that we have not seen that we feel that we probably should have seen by now, committed, buckled down, and watched those films, and we're going to talk about those tonight. And I think it's a really kind of uh, panel-specific yeah. Subject because just because I haven't seen this movie doesn't mean that any of you haven't seen it or anybody listening hasn't seen it, but it's our personal blind spots. Oh, I had a really hard time with this one. I, I guess I should go around the panel and introduce everybody in case you didn't pick up on that. We've got Travis Cito. Hello. We've got Joey Poe. Here I am. And we got Todd. Howdy. And I'm your host, Sean. Without further ado, we're going to jump right in and talk about each other's uh, blind spots. Mm -hmm. And uh, Todd, let's get you to go first. All righty. One of my big blind spots is from one of the all-time great directors whose most of his movies I've seen, although I realize not a lot of his early ones, but in any case, his major ones, but one that slipped my focus for whatever reason was 2001 A Space Odyssey from Mm -hmm. 1968. You're Um, You're about Stanley Kubrick? Yeah. Mr. Kubrick? Yeah. I, uh, my reasoning behind this, I'm, I don't really have a good reason other than I knew that it was kind of a slow burn thinker. It is. And whenever it would pop into my head to watch, I just wouldn't be in the mood for it. Uh-huh. Um, and, and then it wouldn't pop into my head when I was in the mood for that sort of movie. That's the best explanation I have. And how then, long is it? it? I know it's unwieldy, and it seems very long, but how long actually is it? It actually didn't seem that long when I watched it. it I thought it was like three hours. It was like 2.20. Yeah, 2.20 but you, sounds about right. And if you recall, there's uh, the beginning and the intermission both have really long uh, kind of uh, orchestra parts mm-hmm. with black screen that you could theoretically kind of fast forward through. So or if you cut that out, it's be like... be in the yard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> so if you if you take those out, it's probably more like... 205 something like that so it really wasn't as bad as what i was expecting i didn't feel like i was being um that i was having to force myself to kind of get through it even though it did have a deliberate pace it infamously has very little dialogue especially the final uh, act of the film um which is amazing um and i think that's why it didn't bother me that it didn't have any dialogue because it was just too riveting what was happening on the screen my best reason for why i never watched it is just I wasn't in for that sort of movie when I thought of it, and then I wouldn't think of it when I was. So now you've seen it. You you get to see all of those uh, cultural touchstones, Mm -hmm. all those memes, Mm -hmm. all those things, all of those well-known elements in context. What's Mm -hmm. your takeaway? Well, so to be honest with you, um, I... Uh, I was aware of some of them, of course, the whole thing with Hal, mm-hmm. um, which I actually found myself kind of moved when he was like uh, begging for his life, even though he had just murdered the whole crew. But nevertheless, I, I kind of kind of felt something uh, for Hal as he was, uh, you know, begging uh, to be spared. The, That's, I, sorry to interrupt, but that seems uh, 
especially prescient now, given our current sort of like fixation mm. with. I was uh, just going to say that Stanley AI. Kubrick predicted nine eleven. Yep. I was going to ask Todd, <laughs> what's your take on AI? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was one of the interesting things about the movie is, in some ways, Hal might have been the most um, emotive character mm-hmm. by uh, you know by the end, um, because there was uh, a lot of the uh, famous Kubrick iciness. Uh, throughout the movie with a lot of the characters. The uh, opening sequence, of course, I was aware of the bone going into the air and turning into the spaceship. It's been it's been parodied so oh, yeah. many mm-hmm. times in so many films, or homaged. Yep. And it was a little campy looking back, the men in like the, the uh, hominid suits, suits I guess, yeah. and still enjoy, but and then when the monolith comes up. I didn't know all the stuff about the monolith. Uh, that, was, that was cool stuff, creepy stuff. Um, the, fe- the giant fetus at the end... Um, of course, I've seen, like Rick and Morty has a, a thing with, right. with, with, that kind of plays off of that, uh, and I had no idea that that was. I, I, I don't think I was really aware of that ending. Um, so it seems like to me that your first time experience with this movie was a positive one. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and pretty pure. I mean, again, I, I noted some of the to- uh, cultural touchstones, but a lot of it, like I, like I said, the, the ending, I did not know what was going to happen. I was very much uh, riveted by what was happening, even though there wasn't the, the, the dialogue, like I said, uh, particularly at the end. Um, that whole sequence uh, with it, with him, uh, you know, after he uh, disconnects Hal and then speeds uh, towards the monolith, uh, all those... You know, trippy vibes, baby. And, yeah, man. Uh, sh- shagadelic, baby. Um, and then the scene in that in that we- he's suddenly in this weird room where he sees himself, and then he turns into that older version of himself, and then he mm-hmm. turns into the other version of himself, and now he's a fetus. Uh, once he reaches the, out for that monolith, if you could describe the message of the movie in one word, it would be like continuum. Yeah. Well, that was one thing that I thought was interesting about the movie is all this debate about is it supposed to be like a cynical thing, like the baby's on its way to destroy Earth, because apparently something that got, uh, that Kubert decided to downplay in the movie is that there were supposed to be these um, nuclear weapon satellites orbiting Earth, and the fetus, some uh, people speculated, might have been going to, like, set them off. Oh, uh, those. wow. But he, d- apparently something like that happened in the novel, I think. There was something about... And uh, Kubrick apparently decided to downplay that element because just a few weeks or a few months before the film came out, um, Russia or the Soviet Union and the U.S. made an agreement that they wouldn't put nuclear weapons in outer space, and he didn't want it to seem like it was uh, behind the times or that it was speaking on something that was too topical or or that kind of thing. Interesting. It's been years since I saw it, but I remember thinking at the time that the fetus was more symbolic of like the next well the next sort of rebirth or the next because it's all about Uh like when the monolith shows up it's like the next step and that's and that i i thought of that as well and that's Mm -hmm. uh, definitely one of the uh interpretations um Uh, the people that have the more positive spin on it but then a lot of people i was reading that had the more negative spin some people say well they're reading too much into what he had to say in the previous film which was um dr strange yeah yeah which was much more negative about human. So they were looking for. Con- so the people that read it that way, I think, are looking at a continuum of right. Kubrick's themes. I was just going to say this. I'm glad you liked it. This is probably the first film that I saw. I um, mean, okay. you know, I was a movie fan since I was a, a kid, but this was probably the first movie that I watched that was kind of like set me on this road to being a, you know either a cinephile or a pretentious prick depending on how you read it uh but it was guilty like, <laughs> both, can be true. both are true with me yeah uh but this was kind of the first one and i rented it because i thought that it was going to be like a standard you know science fiction flick or whatever right. and i was a fan and it is a science it very much is a science yeah. fiction flick but it pushes it in a much more literary, mm-hmm. cinematic, philosophical kind of yep. way. And, and one thing that surprised movie. me about the movie is apparently it was a blockbuster. It made $150 million in 1968 money. So well, whatever budget, that projects you know? to, uh, ten, ten and a half million. Wow. So um, that Good just... Good return. Yeah. yeah. And it seem, doesn't seem like the kind of movie that would have been ended up being a blockbuster, but maybe that just speaks more to the times, and it certainly wouldn't have been a blockbuster today, that type of movie. Oh, no, this would be um, way too heady. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know. I mean, you've got your Dennis Villeneuve's, you've got your Luc Bessons. They're doing 
a little bit more heady sci-fi. You got your arrival. arrival. Yeah, was it was, a, was arrival a blockbuster though? No, it wasn't no, a blockbuster. Was a I love that. I mean, I do. Lo- yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I do love that movie. Sorry, um, Amy Adams. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But um, love you, Amy. <laughs> yeah, though I'm, I'm glad. And I mean, I was almost glad that I hadn't seen it before because I I was really able to kind of sink into the experience and enjoy it. That's um, awesome, man. Yeah, good deal. So 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 this 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 podcast is doing good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, we're doing so good can, deeds. So I can check that off my my box there and not be embarrassed anymore. To you <laughs> lovely. Know. Well, then let's pop over to JoJo. Uh, well, I chose for this one. At first, I want to say there, there was a honorable mention one that I'm going to watch, and uh, Todd actually tried to get me to watch The Dark Knight for this one. Uh, I have not I yet watched it, uh, okay, and I will be seen watching e- it. Either of the other two Nolan Batman films? No. So you've not seen any of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies? No. Uh, right. There's a story about why you I don't necessarily. I don't, don't think, like Batman. I don't. That I don't one think time that, that uh, Christian Bale. No, I was maybe ran into you in the grocery store. With his <laughs> no, he was, he was the caterer on the set that he yelled at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was maybe 16 when the first like dark Batman came out. I guess the Michael Keaton, Keaton one or whatever, Michael. and it came out the same month as Star Trek Five. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I, this is a part a of my life winner, when I had yeah. 1989. Uh, Batman, yeah, Tim Burton Batman, and so I, I, I just started reading like you know movie reviews and like you know again the cinephile journey, and I read the state newspaper in Columbia ran a double review of uh, Batman and Star Trek Five, and the premise of it basically was that like oh here's Batman coming to like blow the doors off of yes. like you know science fiction fantasy type stuff, whereas Star Trek Five still you know living Deeply in the past like a it. dinosaur and immediately I was like fuck Batman <laughs> the, only, the, only, uh, the only subscriber to Variety Magazine in Pillion, South Carolina and that's why to this day I have a hateful grudge against Batman but did you go to I the, do uh, like Christopher Nolan and I will watch The Dark Knight at some point I watched what, what should I do first uh, I'm gonna do Butch Cassidy and the Sundance okay. Kid hell yes yeah. uh, this hell is yeah. one you like the bicycle scene yeah. Uh, I love the whole movie, yeah. Um, but yeah, the bicycle Rain scene, especially keep falling on that. I, this movie might actually be my first big cinema movie, and I didn't even know it because it would come on AMC all the time in like the mid midish nineties, and so I just kind of watched it uh, then, and I watched it a bunch, like when I was probably sixteen, seventeen. I don't really have a reason for why this one fell through the cracks. It just did. Yeah. Um, I like the Western genre, but I'm kind of picky about it. Uh, I don't really care for like the golden age of Hollywood Westerns. I like well, the grittier one of the ones. First revisionist. Yes, westerns. you like the revisionist and, the, uh, type. Yeah, and, and this one, for whatever reason, just fell through the cra- cracks. You know, Butch Cassidy and Son Nets Kid, they're outlaws. They're played here as like rogu- roguishly charming outlaws. You got Paul Newman, of course, as Butch Cassidy. Robert Redford as Sundance Kid, his kind of quiet, quick draw. So they went with an ugly cast. Sidekick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very, very hard on the eyes. You know, uh, if they as is Catherine Ross as Etta too. If mm-hmm. they would have switched the names, the title would not have been nearly as appealing. Uh, appealing Butch Kid and uh, Sundance Cassidy. Sundance Cassidy. Sundance Cassidy. <laughs> doesn't, yeah. doesn't roll off the tongue. Uh, also starring, uh, and I use that term uh, loosely, Sam Elliott. Yep. Uh, oh, as card right, player yeah. number two, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very memorable role. I didn't realize it was he was in the film until I saw. I happened to see him in the credits, but um, this is a very very loose take on the real life uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It says it's based on a true story, but it's a more or less pur- purely mythological take right. uh, on their life. Uh, and my take on it is this: like while it kind of pedals in anti-hero worship like some of the grittier westerns of the time the spaghetti westerns would have been before this Mm -hmm. uh the man with no name fistful of dollars uh uh the man with no name is the character but the movie i'm thinking of is sergio leone trilogy good the bad and the ugly and those yeah Mm -hmm. um this one kind of pays homage to that but to me this feels like hollywood's take on the the anti-hero western because it, you know, you, you wouldn't have seen in the 50s and 60s, you wouldn't have seen a film centered on, you know, two polyamorous outlaws who make their living robbing trains. 
But despite the fact that they're kind of anti-heroes, it very much does have that Hollywood Western mythology, and it's a very lighthearted, kind of breezy picture. So it's kind of yeah. stuck between those two poles, I think. Mm-hmm. This week, and this is purely a coincidence, I started reading Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Just It just happened to come off of my library hold at the same time as this, as I was watching for this podcast. Wait and a minute, these, do you call your ears your library holes? <laughs> library, no, no, my library hold. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had it on hold from the library and it finally came in. And whereas Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid very much revels in and pays homage to Hollywood Western mythology, Blood Meridian, the novel, McCarthy's novel, is a deeply cynical, ultra-violent attempt to just destroy all of that Western mythology. So those two things just happened upon me at the same time yeah. by mm-hmm. pure chance. Well, after you follow that up with uh, the, another one that you thought about watching, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which is probably one of my favorite movies, period, but certainly the more cynical take on the Western. And, and it, it, going so far, Stephen, it's, it's, not, it's not even in the, you know, the typical you know, desert-type setting. It's in mm-hmm. a snowy, wet, uh, you know, Terrible, uh, like Pacific Northwest kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? Yeah, Stop that it. was You're turning me on. <laughs> <laughs> All the prostitutes yourself, are Travis. fat and ugly, and you know that kind of thing. That so. actually made the short list of films I would watch for this podcast. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so, but it's a great movie. So positive experience. We 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 covered this movie on a previous episode. I think we were talking about the new wave of westerns. Yeah, we did a whole the, revisionist westerns yeah, yeah, episode. Yeah. Well, great, this is this is also movie. considered one of the great screenplays by William Goldman, the great As William Goldman. Uh, yeah. Very quippy dialogue. And, and so a, another interesting tidbit that I think that we pointed out on that episode is that originally uh, Paul Newman and Robert Redford were cast inversely. Uh, Sundance was Butch. Oh. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sundance. they both. That, that would have been a, that Sundance. would have been a much worse movie because Robert Redford is not the quippy no. type of guy. That, like he was, he was in the role he should have been in. So uh, All I'm right, glad well, they changed. Well, that. one last thing I want to add. I did, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen this what sixty year old movie, but um, the ending is. Did I started to say ambiguous. So at the, at the very end of the movie, you can stop listening if you haven't seen it. You're going to watch it. Uh, basically, they're holed up. Uh, they're ambushed by. They're in. Bol- they finally in do Bolivia. get to Bolivia, yeah. and the fucking army, the Bolivian army, shows yeah. up, and they don't know that the army's there. They think they're just in a shootout with a couple of guys. They're already wounded, and they go rush out to charge. Mm-hmm. And the you know the film fades to black. Obviously, they're supposed to die. If anybody out there in listener land knows of fan fiction that follows them to Australia where they're I mean, dreaming there is, about going, I mean, there is please one. tell I mean, me. I really do think there is like a... Don't tell me there's a, a motherfucking sequel. I don't think it's a sequel. I think it's like maybe a comic book or something like that that imagines that they escape. Somebody track that down for me please, and alert listeners, me of it. Email us at cinemachopshop at gmail.com. Travis. It's my turn? It's your turn. Jesus Christ, man. I wanted to go first, and then you're like, hey, Todd, hey, Joey, come on. <laughs> All right, so my first one is an overlooked film. It's an overlooked film called Defending Your Life from 1991. It was directed, written, and starring Albert Brooks. All right? First, I'm going to give you the synopsis. Daniel Miller isn't having a good week. For starters... He died after getting hit by a bus. Then he discovers that in the afterlife, he must defend his actions on Earth in order to ascend to a higher plane of existence. While awaiting judgment, he falls in love with Julia, whose near-perfect life on Earth seemingly makes her a shoe in for ascension. However, Daniel's actions in his lifetime might not be enough for him to move on. So it's starring Albert Brooks as Daniel Miller... Meryl Streep as Julia, Rip Torn as Bob Diamond, Daniel's attorney, Lee Grant, who you'd know from Shampoo, uh, as Lena Foster, the prosecutor, Buck Henry. Yay, Buck! Buck Henry as Dick Stanley, (laughs) Daniel's substitute attorney. Now, if you don't know who Buck Henry is, he was in The Graduate, he was in What's Up Doc, Catch-22, Shortcuts, he co-created Get Smart with Mel Brooks. Yep. 
Uh, he was a member of, or is a member of SNL's Five Timers Club, having hosted 10 times between 1976 and 1980. He hosted 10 times in four years. He was kind of a contributor slash He was a writer, writer. for SNL, yeah. yes. He, he wasn't a full-time cast member, but he was always around. Yeah, and then uh, also we have a cameo from Shirley MacLaine uh, as a holographic host of the Pastimes Pavilion, a reference to her publicly known belief in reincarnation. To understand this movie, you have to understand who Albert Brooks was. He was born Albert Lawrence Einstein. His name at birth was Albert Einstein. <laughs> in July of 1947, he was born into a Jewish show business family in Beverly Hills, California. His grandparents emigrated from Austria and Russia. His mother was an actress and his father, Harry Einstein, was a radio personality and comedian who performed on Eddie Cantor's radio program and was known as the Parkia Carcass. <laughs> what? P A R K Y A K A R K U S. Parkia Carcass. <clears throat> All right. You guys have defined that for Basically, like, sit your body down, I guess. Parkia Carcass. Um, <laughs> all of his four brothers are in the business as well. He grew up among business families from, uh, Kirby in Kirby. Southern California, attending Beverly Hills High School with Richard Dreyfus and Rob Reiner. Wow. So if that gives you like a feel for his um, comedic sensibilities. Yeah. By age 19, he had changed his professional name to Albert Brooks, joking that, quote, the real Albert Einstein changed his name to sound more intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> In the late 60s and 70s, he was regularly performing stand-up, recording two comedy albums, and working as a comedy writer for television. In 1975, Brooks directed six short films for the first season of SNL. In 1976, he appeared in his first mainstream film role in Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Scorsese allowed Brooks to improvise most of his dialogue. Through the 80s and 90s, he co-wrote, directed, and starred in a series of well-received comedies, playing variants of his standard neurotic and self-obsessed character. He did Modern Romance... Lost in America, which I really want to see. I've seen that one in modern. I've seen Modern Romance, Lost in America, and didn't he do Broadcast News? Was that him? Well, he was on Broadcast News. Okay, he didn't yes. direct it though. Okay. No, he was in Broadcast News. Gotcha. Uh, Mother and the Muse, along with Defending Your Life. Also, he played or did the voice of Hank Scorpio on The Simpsons in the episode "You Only Move Twice." Also, if you're going for a visual reference on this audio medium, he looks just like our good friend Brian. Yes, he does. So the film was well received. It's got a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. If that doesn't sell it for you, Sean, in 2020, it was inducted into the Criterion Collection. Well, that's great. It's, a, it's an outlying kind of movie for the episode. But I understand that you have seen pretty much everything. I've seen all the movies. I mean, you've done your movie marathon for, what, six years now? About 17 years. Yeah, so... Uh, that's If you do 365 a year, you're going to see most of them. Yeah. So Travis, the movies. Travis is digging for obscure films at this point. I'm uh, blind spotting. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Happens once a month. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to jump in with mine. Uh, my first film is from the year 2000. In the year 2000. <laughs> it's Castaway. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I did not see Castaway. I'm dying to know if you loved or hated this movie. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I steered clear of this film. because The sequel to You've Got Mail? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I steered clear of this movie because at the time I was deeply entrenched. You're talking about being the elitist snob film mm -hmm. person. I was not watching this big blockbuster film. I just didn't want to see it. And I never really had anything against Tom Hanks. I, let, I loved some of Tom Hanks' lesser films as a kid. Uh, the Burbs and uh, Dragnet. You know, that kind of... I, I like his stuff that's... Bachelor like, Party? Yeah. yeah. He has a Big lot of movies that are movie. way overrated, though. Like Yeah. And so, I, so, so I steered clear like, of it, 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 it for those reasons. So now I've watched it. Uh, directed by Robert Zemeckis, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Hanks plays uh, Chuck Noland, a uh, 
higher up in FedEx. Um, and, you know, out of all the FedEx commercials I've ever seen, this is the best one. Yes. <laughs> I mean, this movie was clearly funded by FedEx. I a mean, lot of product placement. Wow. Unbelievable. Doesn't so, he, isn't there a scene at the end where he delivers the packages yeah, that yeah, he yeah. Yeah. The, whole yeah. Yeah, the one the one the one package and it's the okay, girl yeah, yeah. that you're like oh does he or doesn't he I'm convinced that UPS shot down that plane mm-hmm. and I'm when he when he delivered the package him. he said you've got mail <laughs> <laughs> uh, it also stars Helen Hunt I mean Helen Hunt oh, uh, oh, playing oh, Kelly wow. Frears. All right, I'm going to be on board with this because I've railed on Helen Hunt on this podcast. Yep. The film, of course, starts out with him in Russia. He's trying to train these lazy Russians how to get the packages out on time. And he comes back home. Helen Hunt berates him because she's mm-hmm. a ironclad bitch. She's, and- a, she's a real... She's a real... Um, what's the word? See you Re- next Tuesday. The yeah. Words, the, the thing that's on your leg... Like a there's a, a a ball and chain. She's a real ball and chain. There you go. Good, you got there, buddy. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she doesn't want him to go away again, and he's like, I gotta go to this uh, this one other thing. We gotta go to Malaysia, and they, <sighs> they they exchange Christmas gifts in the car at the airport. He goes. It has a you know the the, the, the plane has some sort of malfunction. A really cool crash sequence. Uh, yeah, I, for yeah. the time, I thought beautifully well done. done. And he's the sole survivor. He ends up uh, in the life raft, and he washes ashore at his mm-hmm. island. And that, of course, occupies the second act of the film, where he learns how to survive. And the majority of the film. It's really not, though, actually, because the opening of the film is about 20, 25 minutes, and then the final part of the film is a good 30 minutes. So it's really just the meat of the middle. Okay. It's it's the burger. No. As the meat in the hamburger. Didn't that uh, that volleyball get an Oscar nod for supporting actor I as sure Wilson? It, Wilson? It should yeah. have Wilson. He survives. He devises a raft that gets him back into the shipping lanes where he's rescued and he gets integrated back into society. Helen, and Wilson, he loses Wilson he loses, in a he harrowing loses scene. Wilson, yes. Sorry. Uh, Helen uh, has married uh, Christopher uh, uh, Noth uh, from... Uh, Sex in the City, mm-hmm. Mr. Big, Mr. Big. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah Mr. Big. Mr. Big, and uh, they've had kids, and he reconnects with her. And so, how long was he? On four the years. Island? Four. Four years. years. He becomes Can you very, imagine? very adept at surviving after mm-hmm. it is a pretty rough start. Um, he also grows a beard almost as long as Sean's. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, some notes I took in the film. Uh, I can't imagine being stranded, and Helen Hunt is the only picture you have to look at. Oh, oh gosh. Wait, what? Wait, wait. Let me look. Note number two. I don't really a... like his beard. Aspiring. <laughs> I was going to... I think I'm going to echo what Todd was about to say. Uh, Hel- I don't really have strong yeah, opinions I'm very, either I'm way about Helen Hunt. I mean, what, what, yeah, what is the she's deal? She's very plain. Oh, she's People just awful. present her as some sort hmm. of like sexy person, but she's not. She's never been sexy. No, and... She's a, at the yeah. very best astringent and angular. She hmm. was she was cute and girls just want to have fun. Wasn't she in that with uh, Sarah yeah, that Jessica Parker? That was her, her yeah. peak. She peaked in high school. Yeah. Is it just me or was the starting the fire scene a bit like masturbation? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, he really got there. Apparently, when you are on an island by yourself, you pass out a lot. Oh, he was malnourished. Yeah. Well, there was a whole thing with the tooth. Yeah, as well. yeah that that was pretty excruciating. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was pretty rough. Uh, and then, of course, there was the tree that looks like a person that has the mm-hmm. noose on it. I was like, yep, that's a little pretty. on the nose. And then later, there's a payoff. Mm-hmm. Um. So did you like it? I thought it was fine. I didn't. I, I like that movie a lot. I like this movie a lot too. It's a blockbuster. It's it's survival. Yeah. Kind yeah of yes, thing. it's yes, it's sentimental, but it's it's a blockbuster yeah. type thing. And I yeah. really that's probably one of my favorite Tom Hanks movies. Honestly. It's a Tom Hanks vehicle, and he um, drove that. Yeah, he did. Mm-hmm. he did. He did. Yeah. He definitely carried the film. You might say that to... he was the captain now. Mm-hmm. Yes. To me, that was the you film. Might. If you were going to give him a Best Actor Oscar, that's the more memorable role than say. I mean, I got. And he was. I'm not a big Forrest Gump guy, and certainly Philadelphia is very forgettable. Yeah. Yeah, he um, was nominated. Uh, I was surprised that Robert Zemeckis was the director. I felt that it probably would have been better suited for like a Ron Howard. It is interesting mm-hmm. because Zemeckis is known for visuals. Yeah. And this movie is, I mean, it's got good scenes. It's yeah. got good setting, but it's not a visual movie. Yeah. 
Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't play to his wheelhouse. And that's why I was like, oh, Zemeckis did this. Wow. I, I totally thought like like a Ron Howard would yeah, be the one to like do it. Yeah, it seems like a Ron Howard movie. Yes, there's yeah. a lot of sappiness. I, I will give or a the, Rob Reiner. Uh, yeah, Rob Reiner would do it well, too. I give the movie a lot of credit for the reuniting scene with uh, Tom Hanks reuniting. and Helen Hunt. They resisted the obvious. So then you can feel you can feel the, the, the emotions and the connection between the two. She's torn because she's got a family now and things have changed. But in her body language, I'll give her credit. In mm-hmm. her body language, there was this lean forward that she was doing that was like, yep, she really wants to be with him. And. I was like, okay, that's cool. When they, yeah. when the like the the extra reunited scene, right? Yeah, and then she just ends up going back to her family now, yeah. right? Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Yep. And he has to go deal with that. Yeah, I have a uh, a memory of watching this movie for the first time uh, on DVD uh, at my friend DJ's house. Uh, DJ. This is two 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 podcasts in a row where I mentioned uh, yeah, really? my friend Tony from Spain, and he was yeah. with us, and we were <laughs> all Tony. just openly weeping at the end of the movie. <laughs> yes. we were, I'm yeah. sure we. I were. wasn't that moved by it, but I, I did. I thought it was fine. I, I would give it a, a like a solid three out of five stars, maybe. I think so we Tony's had a case of Spain red dog that night. And, Tony's yeah. from Spain. They have weird customs there. They actually. Uh, collect each other's tears in shot glasses <laughs> <laughs> and they shoot it at the end of the movie. Yes. Nice. Um, all right. So that's it. That's the first half of our uh, blind spots. Uh, you haven't seen that episode. So we're going to take a break and go pee in the yard and refill these beers, but not before we say, let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby and get ourselves some blank space, baby, and I'll write your name. (laughs) Okay. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. We promise to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, your sweet tooth. So visit our refreshment center now. Let's go. And we're back. And we all took a pee in the yard and we're opening new beers. Uh, Travis, you said you had a beer check-in. I do have a beer check-in. The first one is going to be the uh, the 420 G13 from Sweetwater because... They got the government weed. <laughs> they do. They do. Um, I've been drinking Dos Equis because of the two X's are the blind spots in mm-hmm. our filmography. Mm-hmm. That's as close as I could get on a uh, yeah. on theme beer. Joey, you brought a cool one. Yeah, it's the uh, Grand Strand Brewing, and it's, uh, what's it called? Uh, Sandy Cheeks. Sandy Cheeks. Yeah. So Grand Strand Brewing is a uh, local-ish brewery. They're in Myrtle Beach. They opened up about two years ago. Uh, if that, yeah, I think about two years ago. And, this one's uh, like so, a uh, West Coast style IPA, yeah. and it's uh, it's okay. Good so style. far, so good. It's kind of like uh, a little behind the times, I think, in style. But their hazy IPA is really nice. Yeah. They um, they're much better than other alternative uh, breweries in Myrtle Beach. Yes, and Todd, you've got. Oh. Edmund o- Edmund's Oast uh, from uh, Charleston, South Carolina Brewery, and mm-hmm. it is the Bound by Time. IPA. Bound by Time is good. It is yep. good. Solid beer. Very good. Yep. All right. We're going to roll right into the second half, mm-hmm. and we'll keep the same uh, um, rotation rotation going. So, Todd, you're up next with your next film. Don't okay. fuck with the so, cypher. Uh, I think uh, this, this one actually got more uh, gasps of shock from uh, our crew here than did uh, my first film, which is... Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's great action film, Predator, from the How 80s. How is it that you've not seen the I'd original seen some Predator? Scenes this from one a... is shocking, yeah. Well, so <laughs> I, 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 I think I have a better explanation for this in 2001. Um, I think it just so, I just sort of missed it during the VHS era. And I'm then... sorry, uh, this movie did not come out in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> Right. See, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the premise of what you just said. You just sort of missed it in the VHS era because when you walked into your small town VHS rental shop, no, when I was in right South there. Carolina, yeah. there would have been five or six copies of Predator mm-hmm. sitting there that yep. you had to walk right. Past but what I mean when I in mean, order yes. to get in a spit on your grave or something. But here's the thing: when it initially came out, I wouldn't have been old. I would have been going to the VHS store with my parents, so you're who too would young not at have the re- time. So I was too young. Okay. They and would then let when I got older, the movie. Yeah. 
And then when I got older, I uh, think I got too snobby. I just assumed that it was short, like a, a mindless Schwarzenegger action flick. Now, I think that's what this. happened. Did you watch any of the subsequent films? No, no. You've never, never seen a Predator well, film. I was until... like, well, I've never seen Predator. Well, so it's all downhill from here except yeah, exactly. for Prey. <laughs> Prey is great. Prey is yep. good. So, yeah, so I think I got snobby about, you know, my, okay. w- what I would, you know, and just didn't watch it after that. Uh, but then, you know, I realized as years passed, it's like, oh, this seems to be more highly regarded than I expected it might mm-hmm. be. And so uh, when I watched it, uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it. So your uh, snobometer went down a little bit. It did. And you allowed yourself <laughs> it did. And to actually, indulge in this. My snobometer had gone down enough to allow for it years ago, but I just, for just whatever reason, just didn't it. get around to it. To me, this movie, though, is like a sci-fi update of the classic film uh the most dangerous game if you've ever seen that where you know this guy goes to a rich guy's island and the rich guy hunts him yeah and so this based on the book and Mm -hmm. also there's been many film very very many iterations many many iterations of that right and this is kind of the premise of this movie this alien lands uh they don't really give us any background about this alien except we it seems like we learned that, that he just goes to earth every 20 years or so and hunts people for sport He's just, you know, that finds uh, it's their the, hunters. That, that is the beauty yep. of that first film mm-hmm. is because there's so much. You don't unexplained. have to know anything other than he's out to kill. That's exactly. it. That's all you need. Um, and, Honestly, uh, I kind of like digging into the, yep. the mythology and the uh, yep. ecology of the well, it gave them species. Great, it lately. gave them great fodder for the sequels and mm. stuff, which was cool. And well, can well, we which, talk which about the crossovers? Yep. Oh, God, Alien Jesus. versus Predator. Yeah. I like well, them. Save it. Me too. Save it. <laughs> uh, one thing, though, that I thought was cool about the movie is that, you know, my snobbishness about it, I think the uh, they were the, the filmmakers were aware of this because they kind of played up to that initially, where it seemed like it was just going to be one of these exploding huts, yep. uh, mm-hmm. action one line. You know, in the, in the first you know fifteen minutes or so, Arnold's getting off one one liner yeah. after another. Kind of seems like one of those dumb action flicks. But then once the twist happens and we find out all's not what we thought that it was, yeah. it gets much more serious tone. Um, and the movie, the movie really condenses in on itself yeah. very quickly. Uh, the cast, I think, buffets what you were just saying mm-hmm. about, you know, you've got Carl Weathers, rest in peace. You've got Bill Jesse Duke. Ventura. Yeah. Yep. Bill Duke was fantastic in yep. this. Does uh, Jesse the Body get the... It, he delivers the, I ain't got time to bleed. Yep, I ain't got yeah, time yeah, to yeah, bleed. Yeah. That was him. Yep. Now you tell me what you're going to do if you're bleeding out in the middle of Panama and the Predator's standing over you. You tell me what's going to happen. That's actually a pretty spot Thank you, on Jesse Ventura, for yeah. that audio clip. We uh, appreciate it. <laughs> That's actually still can't spot believe on we that. got you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so uh, so I liked that the movie showed a little bit of self awareness at the beginning, and then uh, the uh, the middle. I mean, it, it's very smart the way that it plays out in the middle of the movie. The way that uh, so, you know some of the stuff uh, with the um, some of the uh, graphics and stuff are a little bit dated, uh, but that's okay for the most part. Though I think so it works I pretty think well for the time. For the time, it yeah, it was amazing special mm-hmm. effects, especially yeah. the design of the predator itself. Yeah. No that I'll, insectoid yeah. mouth, yeah, yep. I mean, and then amazing. the um, the like uh, infrared vision mm-hmm. that it had mm-hmm. that was that had not really been done before. Yep. Um, and then uh, the fact too, it was a little creep, nice little creepy touch that it would mimic people. And mm-hmm. then uh, when it finally lost Arnold Schwarzenegger, it, it did that. You know, it was like, all right, I'm gonna take you down with me thing. And then it did the laugh of his friend to signal the fact that he was about to blow shit up. Uh, all right, I quick, thought that was a nice little, little quick touch. question: Is the line "Get to the chopper" from this? Yes, or from Commando? "Get to the chopper"? I thought of you when uh, okay. when that happened. Uh, yeah, he, he says it to me. He said, "Yeah," because uh, you've said it a couple times when I've I, done the podcast. But, I yeah. say it a lot. Uh huh. <laughs> well, I think I think uh, particularly when I was talking about Kindergarten Cop in one yeah. episode, you mentioned it. But yeah, "Get to Very the chopper." Nice. Uh, yeah, that's in there. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I I was very impressed with it. Great performances, like I said. Bill Duke was really good um, as. Uh, one of the uh, uh, soldiers who starts to kind of lose it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a really smart film, actually. Okay. For you know, I think we might have to do a Aliens versus Predator franchise overview. Oh yeah, type oh yeah, I'm done. Do I think that'd do be fun. Episode, yeah. I, I'm a fan. I mean, the Alien versus Predator movies—they are what they are. Yeah. I think they're low stakes, but, exactly. Yeah. But they're pretty damn good. It's not and... like Star Wars versus Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's another episode. But <laughs> I, I mean, I think that Todd is standing upon the precipice of an undiscovered country here because yeah. there is a rich wellspring of sequels and crossovers in this franchise that you can explore. Yeah. And Alien is one of your yeah. your favorite films, right? Uh, the first one, yeah. I like it a lot. So there's a whole crossover here, mm-hmm. yeah. too. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're, 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 we're in exciting times here in, in Todd's life. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, Joey, what you got, man? This next one is perhaps the most egregious oversight mm-hmm. in my film-watching acumen. And it, this one is doubly egregious for me because, A, it's a very iconic film, but also it's kind of in my own personal wheelhouse. Like, I'm a huge fan of film noir, mid-century film noir, and this isn't exactly a noir, but it's noir adjacent. It's Casablanca, in case you haven't figured that out yet. Um, nobody figured it nobody out. Nobody figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Anyway, it's it's a, you, you'd say it's noir adjacent. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah, got yeah. Humphrey Bogart basically doing his Sam Sp- his Sam Spade. Yeah, stick. totally. It's a dark sort of film, and often when I watch movies like this one that have accrued all of this cultural and critical cachet, I am somewhat skeptical. I, I, I'm, I'm I'm let down. Okay, uh, a little bit just yeah. because. Even if they're not bad, they can't live up to the hype. This the one, one hundred percent, lived up to the hype. So, it's a badass movie. Casablanca, as I'm sure everyone listening knows, uh, is set in Casablanca, which was in then French occupied Morocco. Uh, Morocco set uh, came out in 1942. Set very much in World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, Rick's Cafe American, where all of the rich elite from Europe have descended upon North Africa in an attempt to get the fuck out of Europe uh, at this time. Uh, the big door prize is a ticket to Lisbon, from which you can depart to North America. Um, the film takes place uh, there amidst that whole drama. Uh, Rick, the owner of the bar, played, as I said, by Humphrey Bogart, is moving along just fine. He's trying to stay neutral, stay out of the war, but of all the gin joints yep. in all the world in all the towns in all the world, Ilsa, his former love, uh, has to has walk, to into, this walk one. into his, she's now married to a Czech, uh, dissenter who has escaped. There's a wealthy Czech dissenter who has escaped from, uh, Occupied concentration camp. And therein lies the plot of the film. I don't know what Played I can by say. Ingrid Bergman. Played by Ingrid Bergman, yeah. Uh, this one is also is directed by uh, the very prolific Michael Curtis, uh, who, it, a couple of things that, that I found interesting here. He did, uh, he made a lot of like swashbuckler films like Ventures of Robin Hood, but he also did Angels with Dirty Faces. Nice. He did White Christmas, which is the first movie that I ever discussed on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Whoa. In Travis's uh, mm-hmm. living room long, long ago. That was a while ago. Uh, yeah. Good and times. He, he also did a film called Mission to Moscow, which was essentially a propaganda film. Are you talking about Police Academy 3, no, Mission I, to Moscow? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. But it was commissioned by FDR. Uh, and he also is responsible for the current laws that we have about animal cruelty on set after 12, 25 horses died during the filming of his film, Charge of the Light Brigade. So wow. he's not responsible for it. Like, he didn't, like, promote that legislation. The legislation is because of him. His epic fuck-up yeah. paid the way for it. But despite that, this is a great, great, great film. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to say about it other than than that. I mean, we're sitting underneath a poster of it yep. uh, and, right now. And the um, title of another great movie comes from this film. Does anybody know? We'll always have Paris. No? No, that's a Star Trek The Next Generation episode. God damn it, Joey. <laughs> Nerd. Anybody, anybody. What now? There's a title of a famous 1990s film that we all love that comes from a quote in this film. Oh, I don't know. The Usual Suspects. Oh, gotcha. Ah, yes, at the very end, mm-hmm. the uh, French officer played by Claude Rains, uh, yeah. after uh, Rick is killed 
the German officer, mm -hmm. in order to protect his love, he tells him to round up the God. usual suspects. God, this movie is so stocked with good actors, too. You got Peter Lorre in it. It's so good. And it's I a think great that film. This is a great film. I wouldn't say that it's the best film of all time. No. But I do think that it is perhaps the pinnacle of... Bogart? I know. I was a little bit in my cups last night when I texted <laughs> Sean and said... Uh, I said, I and they tell the, if you were being said, serious or funny. Dude, Casablanca is the pinnacle of Western culture. Did I say that? Is that what it said? <laughs> That's what civilization. You said. Oh, it's the, Western, Western civilization. Western civilization. Okay. And the downfall is tater tots. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. That's another podcast. <laughs> but I wasn't far off. I wouldn't say it's the the best film of all time. But I, I'm, if good. I had to put a movie in a time capsule to represent the golden era of Hollywood, you know, yeah. that whole mid century thing, this would be it. Like, name a better one. Yeah, it's got I mean, have you seen the Maltese Falcon? It's pretty fucking good. It's also very good. But this The not, African Queen? Yeah, that's another one that's yeah. great. But oh, Casablanca right. has so many iconic moments in the film, I think that uh the quote worthy play it again worthy, Sam. and And he never actually says he that. He never actually says it. Yeah. Uh it's it, it's a good movie, and it definitely has its flag in the ground in terms of those kind One of One thing he does say, here's looking at you, kid. Another thing that amazed me about this is that, like, this is a movie very much about World War II, which was made pretty much in real time. Yeah. It was made in 1942, and you can kind of see it. Maybe I'm getting a little up my own ass here. But you can kind of see this film as like a critique of America's neutrality. Yeah. Because Rick himself is very much into staying neutral. Right. Like he, you know, he doesn't want any trouble in his bar, no politics in his bar. Um, but then over the course of the film, he's forced to choose. Yeah. Uh, and he chooses, you know. Much like the United States had to choose whether or not to be involved. Yes, and so that's Go doubly shiny. interesting because there's a, a previous film uh, in Michael Curtis's filmography which was kind of thought of at the time as a scathing critique of America's neutrality. I think he kind of watered it down and made it, you know, amenable here. But just, I mean, just a great movie. Instantly jumped near the top of my best of all time. I love it. Good deal. Um, Travis, do I even dare ask what... Big blockbuster movie that you well, haven't first, seen. I want to. I want to do another beer check in. <laughs> Go ahead. This is Waves on Waves by um, Westbrook. Westbrook, yeah. Westbrook Brewing, and it's a double dry hopped, double IPA, and I think it's fine. It's a little bit malty. Your thoughts? It's a little funky, a little bit too malty. It's overdone. Overdone. You know, every time I bring a beer. It's not your fault. It's Sean not, got something to say about it's, it's, it. I'm not <laughs> slamming you. You didn't brew it. Ed Westbrook did. <laughs> My is, movie. Is that a shot ac across the bow towards uh, the gentleman oh. you just named? No, no it, I, I like it, Westbrook. It, Westbrook's, Westbrook fine. Westbrook's fine. Westbrook's uh, fine. We're not going to get into that war. Okay. If um, uh, Mr. Westbrook decides to sponsor us, I especially like the white tie. The white tie's good. <laughs> Mexican I like cake. The, the two claw. <laughs> Two Claws good, Mexican yeah. cake's good. I'm going to do a movie that I've never seen before, and this is a blind spot for me. Like, legit, because it's a PTA film. Paul Thomas Anderson's mm. Punch Drunk Love. Yeah. Great movie. That does seem like a pretty shocking oversight for you. That for, seems Travis, like a movie. Every other one of his movies never seen this. Mm. This is and the first one that we've discussed thus far, I believe, that I have not seen either. So, Well, you didn't see um, Defending Your Life. Yeah, you're right, but I never heard of it either. So, I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Punch Drunk Love came out in 2002, directed and written by Paul Thomas Anderson. So the synopsis, although... Susceptible to violent outbursts, bathroom supply business owner Barry Egan is a timid and shy man by disposition, leading a lonely, uneventful life, partly due to the constant berating he suffers from his seven sisters. He's got seven sisters. Uh, however, several events transpire that shake up Egan's mundane existence. For example, in his loneliness, he calls a phone sex line. The next morning, the phone sex girl calls him back and starts to extort him for money. 
And we're talking 2002. I was say, I feel like we should explain to the to the, to the younger here what a phone, phone sex, sex line is. is. Yeah, so there used to be this thing called 1-900 numbers <laughs> where you could call and it was like 2 bucks a minute. And, you and it talk. would totally show up on your mom and dad's phone bill, by the yes. way. And their credit card experience. <laughs> I was thinking from my cousin's experience. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Nice. They start to extort him, and he's like, no, I'm not going to give you money. I don't have money. You can't have that. I, I sell toilet paper. Philip Seymour Hoffman, his character, gets the boys on the mission, and it's four blonde brothers who come and start like attacking him. During this... He accidentally falls in love with his sister's co-worker, and her name is Lena, uh, but the romance is threatened when Egan falls victim to this extortion scheme. So it's starring Adam Sandler as Barry Egan, an unmarried entrepreneur, and uh, he has social anxiety. Emily Watson, who I think is very underrated, she's a English actress, uh, she plays Lena and she's Barry's love interest in and Elizabeth's friend and co-worker. We got Philip Seymour Hoffman, rest in peace, as Dean Trumbull, the owner of the mattress store, which is a front for this sex line blackmail extortion scheme. Uh, we've got Mary Lynn Radshkub as Elizabeth Egan, who is his sister, who's also... Gosh, she was in 24. She's in Always Sunny in Philadelphia. She's the snail in Always Sunny in Philadelphia. She's the cousin who's always like, like snotty. You would recognize her if you saw her. Mm -hmm. We got Luis Guzman, a regular of oh, PTA films. Love it. As Lance, Barry's co worker. And then Robert Smigel. Mm, Robert Smigel as Walter, a dentist, and Barry's brother in law. Who he confides in after an angry outburst. Robert race. Smigel, creator of the Ambiguously Gay Duo. And uh, the Angry Dog, what's his name? Oh, uh, Triumph 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 Comedy Triumph Dog. Yeah. Comedy Love Dog, him, yes. Yeah. Uh, he's a dentist in Barry's brother in law who Barry confides in. He's like, hey, listen, I, I heard you're a doctor. I need some help. Sometimes I don't like myself. And he's like, Barry, I'm a dentist. <laughs> This is the first foray by Adam Sandler into a serious kind of prestige piece. And the way this came about is uh, Tom Cruise was on set at SNL when then wife. Um, Katie Holmes? No. The other one. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman, Nicole Kidman <laughs> uh, was hosting. While filming Magnolia, Anderson contacted Sander, Sandler through a phone call with Cruz and expressed his intention to make a film with him. And despite being unfamiliar with Anderson, Sander, Sandler agreed. Sandler was in, intimidated upon his first viewing of Magnolia, which is PTA's previous film. Uh, don't get, don't get Sean started be, on that don't one. Don't get me started. <laughs> Quote, fucking terrified and doubt his ability to carry Anderson's next film. Anderson helped alleviate his fears upon personally delivering the script. Sandler's casting was officially announced in November of 20... 2000. In November of 2000. The unconventional pairing shocked reporters as Anderson was a, a filmmaker on the rise that wrote and directed critically acclaimed, acclaimed films while Sandler was known for his negatively reviewed uh comedy romps right like i said this is the first time that adam sandler branched out into a serious role you've got your billy madisons you've got your happy gilmores you've got all of that so in the 1990s or the the 2000s rather he did a serious movie every couple years uh this movie was Fairly well received. We got a 79% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, the website's critical consensus states, odd, touching, and unique. Punch Drunk Love is also delightfully funny, utilizing Adam Sandler's comic persona to explore the life of a lonely guy who finds love. 
I remember this one fell through the cracks for me too. And I remember at the time thinking that I did not want to see Adam Sandler in a serious, serious role, role about anger issues, which is kind of what my impression of it was. Yeah, it is. Now, now that we know what he's done with Uncut Gems and those other ones that you mentioned, it seems like maybe that was an unfair summation. So I'm always rooting for him. Like he's yeah. been wanting an Oscar since 2002. <laughs> and well, and as far I've as been those for him ever since, as far as those comedy romps and gross out comedies go, people want to see him. His, his, yeah, I mean, I mean, his are better across the board than almost any other Saturday Night Live alum, save perhaps Chevy Chevy Chase. Hmm. Fuck Chevy Chase. We well, fuck Chevy we, Chase, but National Lampoon episode, guys, whole other episode. All right, what do we got? All right. Sean. I'm going to close it out with a film from 1997 that goes to prove that in the 90s you could make a movie about anything. Mm -hmm. I'm talking... The world know. was your oyster. Oh, my God. I mean, you, you have movies like Speed. You've got movies like Point Break. And then you've got this, Jim, Face Off. Which I, I also watched for the first time about a month face ago. Face Off. A movie where they fucking get into a discussion about Face Off. Face Off. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? And 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 in the opening scene, Nicolas Cage dressed as a priest dry humps a teenager. Yeah. Oh my God! Directed by John Woo, and don't get me fucking started on John Goddamn Woo. Would you say that when you describe his filmography, you would have two guns? Jesus Christ. And I would twirl and somersault because that is part <laughs> of gunplay. And then there would be a bunch of fucking... And you'd hold it sideways. I'd hold it sideways. It. And then there would be a bunch of fucking doves that symbolize something that never get hit by stray bullets, by the way. <laughs> Fuck people, you. A lot of people don't Fuck even know you. that John Woo was responsible <laughs> for the creation of Woo Girls. Is Every Jesus time Christ. you're at a bar and you hear girls go, Woo! Yeah, it's he get he gets he gets royalties. It's a tribute yeah. to him, totally. I mean, hard boiled, great, fine. Give it credit for what is it, it is. Safe to say you didn't like this movie, Sean. I, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, but John Woo is the crutch master when it comes to directing. I'm sorry, <laughs> the guy found something that people liked, and he leaned so fucking hard into it. Did he do Broken Arrow? Did he? I don't know. Uh, I'd have to look it up. Uh, all right, so. Starring John Travolta playing Sean Archer, which I thought was really funny. Archer! Uh, you've got Nicolas Cage playing Caster Troy with mm -hmm. several meme-worthy shots. Oh, especially yes. the giant yeah. eyeball And he has thing. a twin named Pollock. Caster and Pollock. Yes. Which is a reference. Joan Allen playing uh, the wife of John Travolta. Eve. Gina Gershon playing a love interest uh, in, in the film. Uh, you got Fat Margaret Cho. Um... And a bunch of other people, by the way, that are really interesting to, to point out. Uh, you have Thomas Jane in this film. Yeah. You've got Danny Masterson in this movie. You've got Joe Bob Briggs in this movie. That oh, one is the one that wait, surprised wait, me. Joe I was Bob like, what Briggs the hell? Joe Bob Briggs? He's, he, he's, he's like one of the doctors. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. You've got John Carroll Lynch. you got Matt Ross. I mean, some really quality actors in this movie early in their careers. By the way, speaking of Danny Masterson, how fitting is it that Masterson tried to sexually assault Travolta's daughter in this movie? Yep. And now he's in prison for being a sex assaulter. And mm -hmm. he was recently transferred to another prison because the heat was on. There was a hit put out on him. He got fucking jumped in prison. As he should be. And injured. And then they put him into a more minimal security type deal where he's going to be safe. Mm. So, yeah. Anywho's. Um... With the other rapists. <laughs> oh, this movie. Yeah, yeah it's bonkers. It, it, the, there's no other word to describe it. Yeah, it's bonkers. It's... You have a, a, a criminal and a, an <laughs> FBI agent who are uh, nemeses of each other, and they come up with this crazy plot to take, take his face off. off. And, face and Tra off. so Travolta is going to assume the identity of Nicolas Cage to infiltrate Nicolas Cage's operation. Nicolas Cage wakes up puts on Travolta's face and yeah. kills everybody associated with it. So nobody knows. Yes. Nicholas Can... Cage goes, I'm sorry, not Nicholas Cage. Travolta as Cage goes to super jail 
Yep. And then oh, where they have the lockdown uh, boots. The lockdown boots. The lockdown mm-hmm. boots oh I God. need in my occupation. Oh my I need God. those real bad. The Ugg boots of prison fashion. Yes. The best part of this movie was that John Woo got John Travolta to say this ridiculous chin yeah. as part yeah. of his dialogue. Yeah. Chef's kiss. Yeah. There is a scene, of course, that towards the end of the film where the two of the it's just the two of them. It's the big showdown. Yep. And there's a speedboat chase. Yeah. Oh my god. Dude, this listen, this movie is so Wait, stupid, but it was I'll fun. get there. I'll get fun. there. Um <laughs> Nicholas Cage jumps onto the bo- boat. I guess Nicholas Cage as Sean Archer jumps onto the boat and has a hard time getting his footing. That would have been the time to shoot him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like a good five seconds where he's a prone target to shoot well, him. Well, it's like those kung Maybe fu movies, it... though, where they try to fight you know, Bruce Lee one at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you know. So anyway, uh, those, are, those are some of the points about it. This movie was off the rails crazy. Yes. I avoided it at, at the time. It was 97, so Allie was in grad school. And so when you're in grad school, you ain't got no money. You don't get to go see shit. Mm-hmm. And so it got... I was a junior in high school. Yeah, yeah okay. Same here. It got past me. Um, I remember people watching it on VHS, and I'm like, I ain't watching in this shit and uh i i will give the movie total credit it's crazy yeah. it is it Full is so crazy. fucking crazy you will not be bored watching this no no you can't be bored it's Full of problems. It's full of yes, of course. He, he goes full cage rage. <laughs> oh, the, the, oh, yeah. The, the cage. And I, again, I, the, you're talking about uh, earlier about how you kind of had like these episodes where like I'm not watching so and so's films. Cage, yeah. Cage, and I went through this issue where I was not watching Cage movies, and this was probably the beginning of that 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 point. Mm-hmm. Um, but and now you're back on board. I'm back on board. Yeah. I'm on the Cage train. It's yeah. it's it's crazy. Um, I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It, yeah, it's fun. It is. You have to put all all tethered suspension to re- of disbelief. Has oh, to totally, go out the totally. Window. I'm saying any tether to reality, you've just got to clip because that. they only change faces. Like, wouldn't it have been smarter to have them change brains? But then you couldn't have called the film a face off. I'm sure somebody suggested that. Like in the producing the room, they were like, thing? "Hey, they they yeah, yeah." Where... There, there's like a vocal cord, the vocal thing, thing but they don't and, have the same yeah. body though. Like John Travolta is oh like God, what maybe this movie. And y'all are already thinking too much about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. The thing. That's you the can't point. think about that it. Is the point. Um, Don't think about it. Nicholas Cage's Castor Troy as John Travolta hitting on Travolta's daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, just bizarro. Just uncomfortable. It, yeah. And just the performances were like at at a, an eleven. Yeah. All yeah. the way. Yeah. They, they, both of those guys were having fun with it. They I mean, had to have they been were, having, they were having a, a blast. Time. I mean, so this is probably the first movie that started Nicolas Cage on the path to what we think of as Nicolas Cage. Well, now. That's how you get Wicker Man. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was like the first like step toward the. the, the his, but then also how you get the superior Mandy. His journey when into self parody and then out of self parody. Yeah. Favorite here. shirt. Joey, I, yep. I, I my favorite you. shirt. Yeah, I agree with yeah. you. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, uh, that was one that that definitely stayed in as, as a blind spot for me for for many 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 years. Um, I knew what I was getting yep. into. Uh, there were no real surprises other than somebody greenlit this project, yep. and that's what gave me pause. I was like, "Holy shit!" They would make fucking anything in the nineties. Just favorite. imagine someone I pitching go movies home and like this. Yeah. Face Off. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun, and and that's the thing. It's it's a fun movie that. Well, yeah, it goes back to the John Mulaney bit where he talks about, just imagine someone pitching Back to the Future, you know, or something yeah. like that. Like, this yeah. was 1997. This guy goes yeah. back in time and tries to fuck his mom. I reviewed this movie for the school newspaper at Clemson University. Yes. Uh, and I remember uh, going to the Astro, which was then a doll- yeah, yeah, dollar. Yeah, there was one dollar. Yeah, yeah. No, to watch it. And I reviewed it. Still intact. I wish I could. St- I, it's still I, there. It's still there. It's just sitting there. There's nothing there. It's just sitting there empty. I wish I could pull up that review, but I remember it being mostly positive, and my take on it was a lot like Sean's, that it was ridiculous, but thoroughly entertaining. Yeah, I cannot... uh, Any misgivings I might have about the movie, it's just... It's crazy. Yeah. And it's fun. I'm realizing right now that there's... 
the entirely real possibility that you and I were in the at the same time. Wow. Watching movies. You would have did been like see, what, sixteen? Did you see um, I saw higher learning there? What about um, I saw screamers <laughs> there? Um <laughs> What about Devil's Advocate? Did you watch that there? Don't think so, but it is possible. I think I saw How High there, maybe. No, it's not Devil's Advocate. (laughs) Okay. All right. We're 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 spinning we're spinning out of control. Yeah. We're gonna wrap just it up. Just like the movie we just discussed. Exactly. Look what happens when you bring up face off. Things get crazy. Um all right, so that was a lot of fun going over our Shots our our crazy, crazy blind spots. Uh, Travis, uh, I'm sorry that you've seen all the movies and your blind spots were a little, little yeah. bit more uh, niche. Are they niche? A little bit. That, punch Rock punch Love was a good, good, good one. Punch Rock Love? You mm-hmm. guys have never, never I've never it. seen it. I've, I've really seen it. Yeah. And, and you it. as a PTA acolyte, that was pretty... That's interesting. Yeah. That, that was an oversight. That's a great one. I, I've i never seen the, uh, Casablanca, by the way, so I'll I, we could do a second episode where I have to add my hat to that and we'll talk about it again. Do you guys want to arm wrestle for the picture? The <laughs> poster there uh all right no, joey's getting that joey's getting it. He well he's seen it. it now so i'm the only one left <laughs> in the group all right so that's gonna be it for tonight uh we're going to uh be on hiatus for about three weeks and then we're gonna come back and we're going to do our razzies episode in three weeks yeah it's at the end of march sweet i got somewhere Wait, to go is it march 29th yeah something like that yeah that's my birthday sweet mm, nice. I'll, I'll bake you a cake uh, we're going to do a Razzie's episode. We're going to talk about the uh, deserving and sometimes undeserving films that have been awarded Razzie's for Worst Picture. Please follow us on social media. We're Cinema Chop Shop everywhere except for YouTube, which we are known as Cinema Chop Shop Podcast. You can listen to and watch a video presentation of this podcast. It's just weird. But you don't have to actually see us. You no. don't actually have to actually watch it. No, you can just listen. listen so until next time, uh, love yourself and love your family. and Tell your friends you love them. Please do. Love do you that. guys. And I love all of you guys so much. And please remember to watch, watch. Shop, Shop Retrofit. Retrofit.